Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And today for animal biology, we're going to talk about mollusca, but we're going to talk about, in particular, bivalva. Okay, so we're talking about the phyla, molluscans, and we're going to talk about the class bivalves. Last time we talked about gastropoda, and now we're going to move into kind of a different structure. Nonetheless, um, as successful, okay, bivalves are very su successful in life, um, given that, you know, again, kind of like gastropoda, there's over 30,000 species, um, so very species rich, and they've been around for a very long time. I'll talk about this kind of um, life history in a little bit, but this is called glochidia. And so glochidia is the parasite or parasitic version of a mollusca. Um, some freshwater mussels have glochidia as their larval stage. And the, the kind of purpose of this is for these larvae to attach to the gills of fish and kind of hitch a ride through the environment okay, while parasitizing the fish, so consuming blood and, and whatnot, until they get old enough that um, they can uh, fall off and be dislodged or whatever, and then they'll change into an adult form. Okay, we'll talk about this lifestyle because or lifestyle history because it's kind of interesting um, and it just shows that when we talk about parasitism, parasitism pops up multiple times. It's a very good case of convergent evolution. So it's not that we just see parasites in things like platyhelminthes where we get trematodes and and cestoids and, and monogenic parasites and flukes and things like that. We see it again when we start looking at you know some bivalves. We see it again when we look at some insects. We'll see it again um, as, as we progress throughout kind of um, the different classes and phyla of Animalia. You, s you keep seeing the same kind of thing pop up in these, these different groups. And that's just, you know, that's some evidence for convergent evolution that organisms will converge on a pattern that works. Um, the environment is choosing a lot of times, so natural selection is picking the individuals as best suited. It'll pop up over and over again that you have these different manipulations. Sometimes you're suited for that environment, other times you're not. It just happens to be that parasitism works in a lot of different groups. And we'll come back and we'll talk about some other types of parasites as we progress. But first we're going to talk about the class bivalvia. And so the bivalves consist of clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops. Okay, Again, like I said, similar to the gastropoda, over 30,000 species um, have been named and there's probably plenty to be found still. Um, so very species rich, very successful group. Okay? Now they differ from gastropoda in that the class name gives you an idea of the unique feature that they have. They have a shell okay, which is excreted by the mantle Okay. But the shell itself has two hinges, two hinges. So um, that's where the bivalve comes in, and so it's completely enclosed. The visceral mass is completely enclosed by a mantle and a shell. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that locomotion can't occur outside of that, and it does through the the foot of the organism, okay, being able to move or allow the organism to move throughout the system. Okay? But nonetheless, that um, shell is complete in bivalves. So here's kind of a, a better look of it. Um, so again, you have this mantle. The mantle is going to excrete this um, calcareous kind of material, this shell-like material. The shell itself is controlled, the opening and closing of the shell is controlled by adductor muscles 
anterior and posterior adductal mu adduct adductor muscles, okay? Um, to figure out which side is anterior and which side is posterior, you need to find the umbo. And the umbo is going to be kind of the, the bigger, the, the thicker part of the shell. That's going to be the anterior side. Okay? And typically the anterior side will also, um, the, the umbo will also be more progressed or larger on the dorsal surface. Than on the ventral surface of the organism. Okay. We'll look at some of the internal structures of these guys as we progress. Okay. So <clears throat> when we look at bivalvia, it's kind of got a, a different life history in the sense of feeding than um, gastropoda. It's lost the head portion of the organism, so there's really no sensory organs, there's no eyes, there's no feeding um, tentacles or anything like that, and there's no radula. So it's lost its rasping mouth parts. Instead what it's developed is the ability to filter feed. And it filter feeds by some distinct kind of gill structures. And so they have gill structures just like gastropoda aquatic gastropoda in the sense they use the gills to exchange um, gas ex or for gas exchange with the environment okay so gills they live in water they're exchanging carbon dioxide and oxygen through the water column with gills okay? but they also have another set of gills bivalva does okay? another set of gills which are made of more like lamellae little thin sheets that have the ability to excrete mucus. Okay? And so they have gills for respiration, but they also have gills for feeding. Okay? And that's fairly typical of filter feeders um, as you progress up. So the cilia creates this water current, um, and that's going to allow for the siphons to move water into the system and move water out of the system. As food particles move through the gills, okay, if it's food, okay, it gets encapsulated and transported along kind of food grooves with some mucus into the labial palps. Okay, and the labial palps is um, kind of a unique set of gills. And then those gills um, will push the food uh, vacuoles or the food material into the mouth and then into the stomach and intestines, etc. Like, like digestion normally occurs. Okay. The particles that are not digested, they get kicked back and pushed out of the system through a siphon. Okay. And we'll look at this in a little bit. Okay. Um, so it's very kind of a very unique system. However, it's fairly efficient in the sense that um, they can filter out uh, phytoplankton, algae, microscopic um, organisms, small, uh, even small invertebrates, invertebrates like juvenile invertebrates and things like that can be sucked in and consumed. Okay. Now the digestion occurs um, in kind of what we're going to see again in the formation of kind of a crop and a gizzard. But in the case of bivalves, they have their own digestive system okay, and their own digestive features. Now, they're, they're like the precursors to the crop and the gizzard. Okay? So the crystalline style is a hard piece of calcareous material that's inside a kind of a sac, the gastric shield sac. Okay? Now, that gastric shield will excrete digestive juices and things like that, but that crystalline style will grind the material, the food material. Okay. So we'll come back to this when we talk about crops that occur in things like annelids. And the way that they grind their food is by consuming little small pebbles and putting it in the crop and then grinding it. In this case, the bivalve has made its own little teeny pebble in the form of a crystalline style. Okay. And that's kind of acts like a, a mortar and a pestle, I guess you could say, 
Um, so it kind of grinds the material. I'll show you a picture in a second. Okay. So again, bivalve feeding, um, little, you know, fairly different from the gastropod feeding. There's no rasping radula or anything like that. Instead, there is just um, filtration. So it's just taking in water and food particles through the X current opening. Okay. So that's going to remove or move water into the system. That water is going to pass through the gills, cross the gills. Okay. Some of the purpose of the gills is to for respiration. So it's going to pull off oxygen, kick back carbon dioxide. This is an open circulatory system. Okay. So there's no veins, no arteries, no capillaries. Okay. I'll show you the heart in a second. It's open. Okay. So that material is going to be passed if it's, you know, oxygenated material. So it's pulling oxygen. It's going to be kicked into the hemofluid, into the blood fluid. Okay. And then that'll be allowed by the heart to be pumped through the system and exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide, etc. If it's a food particle, it will get kicked to the labial palps. The labial palps then put a mucus covering on it. So it kind of makes a food vacuole, and then it gets placed in or slides down the feeding groove into the mouth of the organism. The mouth then gives rise to the stomach. The stomach is inside the foot, okay? and then it, from there it goes into the intestinal tract. Okay? If it's deemed not food, so it's sand or something like that, or pebbles or rocks or um, chitin or something like that, it gets kicked back out, the X current um, or in current, depending on um, whether it's coming in or out, okay? it gets kicked back out of the system. Okay? And so that's the filtration system that you're seeing. Okay? okay, so a little more on the internal structure, okay? a little bit different than um, gastropods, but again, very similar. So you got that food particles coming in. That's going to make it into the labial palp, into the mouth. The mouth gives rise to the stomach, okay? and then into the intestines, the intestines out through the anus. Okay? The intestines kind of wrap the heart, okay? so it can supply the heart with nutrients. And so the hemo, the blood, gets nutrients from that. It gets its oxygen from the gills. Okay. You also have a filtration system with the nephridum, okay, which in bivalves is often called a kidney. Okay. It's probably not to the point of deserving the term kidney, um, but nonetheless, it's often called the kidney. Um, but the nephridum has the same kind of premise, the same purpose. Okay. Um, filtration of hemol, take nitrogenous waste out, etc. Okay. Um, as far as the rest of it goes, if you look at the kind of gastric shield, so inside the stomach, this is what you're going to find. You're going to find that crystalline head. Okay, and you know, again, like I said before, this is kind of like a mortar pestle. Okay? This will pump up and down and crush and churn up food. Okay. Um, there's some digestive enzymes associated with this through the digestive glands and the material would be digested and then passed into the intestines. Okay. The other thing that we haven't talked about yet with bivalves that differ from gastropods, gastropods have six brains or six ganglia. Okay. Bivalves have three okay, and they're in distinct regions to control distinct portions of the body. They have a pedal ganglia, okay, which controls the foot region and movement of the organism. A cerebral ganglia, which co controls sensory, but it also controls things like digestion, other things, um, and kind of the cerebral portion of the, of the organism, so the mouth and things like that. And then they have a visceral ganglia, which controls uh, a lot of the heart activity, kind of some uh, gill activity, and the freedom, that material. Okay? And so three kind of lobes of the nervous system, three brains, 
okay, or three ganglia, okay, each controlling a different, a distinct region of the body. All right, <clears throat> so again, like I said before, it's an open circulatory system, just like gastropoda. Um, the mantle and gills oxygenate, oxygenate the blood. Okay. The nephrida is going to filter that material, filter out waste, etc. Um, again, all of it open. So um, you get mixing of material that needs to be filtered and mixing of material that doesn't need to be filtered. And that's one of the premises behind open circulatory systems. One of the problems is that the material gets mixed. So you don't have a way, a, a good way to control that contamination. And then like I said before, the nervous system instead of six ganglii um, in like gastropods, bivalves have three ganglii. Okay, they're interconnected, they control the different regions of the organism. Reproduction, most are dioecious. Okay, so there are male and female um, clams and oysters, etc. Now there are some that are not. Okay, the gonads are held within the visceral mass, okay, um, and will be released into the water column. So, for majority of species, this is external fertilization. Okay, remember these organisms live in the water. Okay, they're going to release sperm and egg into the water. Okay, so. When we talk about you know aquatic species again, like I said before, most organisms are have external fertilization. Now, interestingly, reproduction is a little bit different. Okay, in a lot of the organisms, unless they have glycidia larval stages, in a lot of the organisms they'll have a trochophore larvae stage and then a valigular larvae stage. So the trochophore um, is first. And that's free swimming with kind of cilia, okay? And then you have a valigular larval stage, which is going to be kind of like a miniature version of the juvenile. Um, but they can have different life histories, okay? But trochophore will give rise to valigular, valigular will give rise to juvenile, then juvenile will give rise to the adult. In some species, like I said before, you have this parasitic larval stage, okay, which we call glycidium. Okay? And so the family Uinidae, okay, they're pretty, pretty much the, the family that we go to when we're talking about this parasitic larval stage. It's not to say that there's not other parasitic larval stages within um, bivalva, okay, but the whole family Uinidae is parasitic or has parasitic larvae. Okay. So again, trochophore larvae, you're going to have these ciliated larvae that have the ability to swim, move throughout the water column. Okay. They give rise to the valigular stage. Often the valigular stage will be stationary, okay, either in, in the sediment of, the, of whatever the water column is. They'll be found there. Um, fairly similar in kind of life history characteristics as the adult. Um, they have a true digestive system, everything like that, and they can stay in the valigular larvae for a, uh, quite a while, depending on the species. Um, you know, they can spend quite a bit of time. They do have the, the mantle as excreted material, so they do have a shell Okay, so they have a shell that's covering them, unlike the trochophore larvae. Okay. And then you have this glycidia larvae, which I've already shown you a picture about, and kind of have these, what we call shell teeth, and um, they allow for the attachment onto the gills. Okay. Now, in order to get fish to come by, a lot of these freshwater bivalves um, have developed lures. So here you can see this one kind of looks like a fish. And so this is the foot of the organism and it's developed kind of a fish-like lure. And it will wiggle that lure in the water column 
until other fish come by and are going to try to take a bite out of it or eat it. Okay? And then when they come by, they expel their glycidia. So they house their glycidia in, inside and then they burst out their glycidia into the mouth of the fish and those glycidia go down attached to the gills and then they can parasitize that fish. There's quite a bit of diversity though when you're talking about 30,000 species. Um, you can go from organisms like the giant clam which might weigh over 400 pounds, massive um, organism that can live well over a hundred years. Okay? Um, estimates have even been like probably up to 200 years old, so very ancient old organisms live for a very long time, get very large, uh, and so we're starting to see that ability for organisms as we progress through the different phyla, the ability for organisms to utilize nutrients in a more successful manner, live longer, reach a bigger body mass, etc., um, have a lot more specialized features as we progress. Okay, So you can get these giant clams. We also got you know other things like rock scallops which are notorious for building kind of symbiotic relationships with things like stinging sea anemones and they they'll allow for sea anemones to attach to the outside surface or they'll find regions where there's lots of sea anemones and um, inhabit that region in order to just provide extra protection for the organism. Okay, So that's bivalva. Um, Fairly similar to gastropods, but some of those distinct differences in digestion with, you know, the crystalline style and the gastric shield, and differences in the nervous system with three ganglia versus six ganglia, okay, and um, you know, difference in the mantle, the shell okay, is hinged and and it completely covers the visceral mass. Okay, um, the next group we're going to talk about is cephalopoda. Okay. The cephalopods are very different than the other mollusks. Um, very successful group, very different, and you'll see that in some people's minds, they don't even belong in mollusks because they're so different than the other groups. Okay? So next time, cephalopoda. Oh, sorry. One last thing. Um, another body feature that's kind of unique in some of the bivalves is kind of like the gooey duck or what's called a razor clam. Right? They can have an extended foot with the siphons um, so you actually rarely see the man, the shell of the organism. Okay? It's rarely exposed. The foot is exposed um, and then they'll they'll bring it back in when danger comes. Um, lots of people eat gooey ducks if you're on the west coast so you probably um, experience that if you live in western regions. Okay. Alright, so cephalopods um, is next and uh, we'll progress through mollusks into annelids and then talk about worms and other things.